Hello, hello, hello. I'm Scott Stevenson. I'm president and CEO of the Museum of the American Revolution, where we are dedicated to a simple idea that we need to ensure that the promise of the American Revolution endures. It's wonderful to be with you. There are about a hundred of you who are gathered with us from across this beautiful land, from Michigan, from New York, from the Redwood Forest to the Gulf Stream waters. Thank you all for being with us tonight. This is the second in our Read the Revolution virtual speaker series uh, tonight. And of course, sponsored by the Haverford Trust Company. Our friends at Haverford, and you'll, you'll hear from Tim Gillespie from Haverford in just, just a moment, have been such great stalwart supporters of the museum since long before we opened. Uh, and I'm so grateful for the major support that they continue to provide, particularly for our Read the Revolution series. And now this is more than just the speaker series that we're all participating in tonight. And as if that wasn't good enough. I hope all of you received an email before this evening, those of you who are not members, and about a third of our, our 100 participants tonight are, uh, are not members, many uh, joining us this evening for the first time. So I hope you enjoy your evening. Very simple ask, that is to sign up for that Read the Revolution bi-weekly email that you receive. These are curated excerpts from great works of history, children's books, novels, etc., but all around the theme of the American Revolution. So it's a little short curated excerpt. It'll arrive in your email box. It'll only take five minutes and it'll really connect you with um, all the exciting work that's going on in thinking about and writing about the experience of all kinds of people and the uh, ongoing experiment in liberty, equality, and self-government that we call the American Revolution. Now, in addition to that bi-weekly Read the Revolution email, for those of you who are our Revolution Society members, we have just started a new series as part of Read the Revol Revolution called Founding Footnotes. And this is kind of like a book club, but different in that we gather together, of course, it's all virtual at the moment, and hopefully eventually we'll add back some, some uh, in-person experience as well. But that's where we dive deep in a facilitated discussion about a primary source, a document, for instance, uh, we recently did one that was about uh, General Washington's um, final uh, orders to the Continental Army at the end of the Revolutionary War. Uh, coming up in March, we're going to be talking about Abigail Adams' famous Remember the Ladies letter that she wrote to John Adams early in 1776, uh, advocating that uh, John hurry up and not just declare independence, but in the system of laws that would come about as a result of that declaration that more attention would be given to the political position of women. That original letter first time it has been back in Philadelphia since 1776 is on display 22 feet below where I'm sitting right now in the museum. If you have a chance to visit us in person, we're open Friday through Sunday right now. Through um, And if you're here before the end of April, you can actually see that letter on display as part of our When Women Lost the Vote uh, uh, special exhibition. Uh, so you want to check out our, our membership there if you're not already a member for all these great programs. Our next Read the Revolution is coming up on March 9th uh, with Cassandra Good and her book called Founding Friendships about platonic relationships, friendships between men and women in the period of the um, early Republic. Now, as I mentioned, there's about a hundred of you here tonight, two thirds of whom are already in the family, already members, and thank you for the support that you give to the museum and for your love and uh, connection to us. I hope those of you who are joining us for the first time really do enjoy the program this evening and uh, you'll, you'll look to get a little bit more involved with us. Now, before I introduce our distinguished guest this evening, Dr. Jessica Millward, I just wanna introduce Tim Gillespie. Tim is the vice president and the director of client management at Haverford. And not only that, but Tim and his wife, Susan, members of our Revolution Society uh, in the before times, we would all be gathered here uh, having a glass of wine together before walking over to Liberty Hall and enjoying uh, yet another wonderful speaker event here at the museum. And so without further ado, I'd like to welcome uh, Tim to say a few words about, uh, about Haverford. Thank you, Scott, and good evening, everyone. As Scott mentioned, my name is Tim Gillespie. I am the Director of Client Management for the Haverford Trust Company. Haverford Trust is based in Radnor, Pennsylvania, and is a privately owned wealth management and personal trust company established 42 years ago. 
manage approximately $11 billion for individuals and institutions. And as a local firm, we are very committed to this community. We've been fortunate enough to have enjoyed a relationship with the Museum of the American Revolution for a number of years and are proud to be the sponsor of this Read the Revolution program. There is no more important relationship to us than the museum. And we continue to enjoy working with Scott and his amazing team. We firmly believe in the mission of the museum and I think it has filled an essential niche in Philadelphia. We hope to continue our relationship for many years to come. We've had the good fortune to host numerous client events at the museum over the last several years. And in fact, we had staff at the museum this week filming for an upcoming uh, program that we're doing for our speaker series for women. While I'm disappointed to not be with you in person this evening, I'm glad to hear that the museum is open on a limited basis and we are inching closer to the day when we can do a program in person. The museum has demonstrated an amazing ability to conduct wonderful virtual programs, and this evening's is no exception. Like you, I look forward to hearing Dr. Millward's comments, and thank you again, Scott, for allowing Haverford Trust the opportunity to sponsor this fantastic series. I hope everyone enjoys their evening. Thank you, Tim, wonderful, wonderful. We're so, so grateful to you. So um, just by way of sort of teeing up this evening, um, and of course this will probably resonate with those of you who've been to the museum in person. Uh, many of you may have also explored our new virtual museum. So even though the museum's been been closed uh, a little bit at last, uh, obviously for some months last summer and a little bit between Thanksgiving and, and, and January, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, you can explore the core exhibition of the Museum of the American Revolution just through our webpage on uh, through our digital um, uh, digital assets uh, right at the bottom of that uh, of that landing page. And so please do explore that. So for those of you who know the museum, know a little bit about the way we tell history here, it stems from the proposition that all people matter in the story of the founding of our nation. And so the telling of this core exhibition story of the revolutionary era explores the lives and lived experiences and decisions and contributions of all kinds of people who lived in the period. And one of the most popular exhibition areas is a place called Finding Freedom. It's in a gallery about the war in the South and it includes a life cast tableau, a life-size tableau showing a, a group of um, African-Americans who are having a conversation in the midst of the war in Virginia in 1781. And it anchors a touchscreen interactive that explores the lives of five people of African descent who had very different experiences in their quest for personal safety and personal freedom in the midst of that danger of war. Now that interactive was so popular. Uh, parents we noticed were having to drag their children away from it because they just wanted to, to dive into these stories or sometimes children were pulling parents away that we received a grant from the Albert M. Greenfield Foundation. And after a whole lot of work over the last year in October launched an online version of this. And we'll, we'll definitely, I think we've thrown in the chat a link to that. So please grab that bookmark it and explore it later. Now, since launching that in October, over a hundred thousand people have explored this, these stories. And what I think is in, brings um, tonight's speaker together with this story is the challenge of piecing together the lived experience of people of African descent in this period, the challenge that we find in the, the spotty uh, records, uh, in, in um, finding the material lives of these people reflected in uh, museum collections, uh, et cetera. So we were really excited when uh, Dr. Millward's book came to our attention and here it is, Finding Charity's Folk enslaved and free black women in Maryland. And this will be the, the, the sort of subject that will, uh, uh, Dr. Millward will provide her remarks uh, this evening. Now, uh, Dr. Jessica Millward is an assistant professor at the University of California at Irvine. And she's joining us from, uh, from the West Coast, uh, probably a little bit warmer than it is where I'm sitting. She's a UCLA uh, PhD uh, specialist in African American history and early American history of the African diaspora. Uh, she spent uh, time working in Ghana and just is a, an incredibly engaging uh, and a, an exciting scholar who's going to, I think, just rivet us with her tale uh, of piecing together the story of charity folks and the experience of women 
in the revolutionary era of the early public uh, of African descent. So without further ado, I'd like to turn this over to Dr. Millward, Jessica, who's uh, become a good Zoom friend here in the last couple of weeks as we've been getting things uh, together here and uh, chatting before and after the inauguration and all the historical events swirling around us. And so without further ado, I'm gonna stop talking and I'm gonna turn it over to you. Dr. Millward, welcome to Re Read the Revolution. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, Dr. Jessica Millward, or as I'm, I have my students call me, uh, sometimes JMZ, coming to you from the JMZ studio. Um, because aren't we all doing home studios uh, at this point? So, so let me just say, I'm very happy to be here. Um, you know, if you live in the West Coast, you very rarely, rarely um, get to have these engaging conversations about early America and the American Revolution in particular. And now with um, the pandemic, I have to acknowledge that most of us, especially most of us on the, <laughs> mo let me just say most of us have now been sheltering in place for 11 months. Let that sink in. We've been sheltering in place for almost one year. I say most of us, not all of us, but most of us. So I was very excited to get Hannah's email inviting me to join everyone today. So I have set my alarm. Um, we do have a hard out today, um, which means we need to start the question and answers at about 6.50. So I've set my own alarm so that I'll know to end a few minutes early so that we can, a few minutes shy of 6.50 so that we can go on to the question and answers. So today I would like to speak about Charity Folks, the subject of my book, Charity Folks, Slavery's Ghosts and the Liberation of an, of an Enslaved Archive. This is the pandemic edition. This is a long prologue, okay. In 1619, an African woman known only as Angela arrived in Jamestown, Virginia on the ship, the treasurer. Her status has been the subject of great debate. Was she enslaved? Was she an indentured servant? Was she a free domestic worker? Regardless of the answer, anything during the course of, regardless of the answer during the course of her lifetime, I'm a lefty, so I have to change where I'm reading. During the course of her lifetime, Angela and her contemporaries witnessed the legal hardening of racial lines. By the end of the 17th century, blackness and enslavement were inseparable throughout the, most of the colonies. What is at stake by suggesting that this nation's founding occurred actually in 1619 when Angela and 19 others arrived? This has been the primary critique of the 1619 project. As some of you know, um, critics hold firm, very firm, that the United States was founded not in 1619, but in 1776. So hostile and visceral have the critiques been that the New York Times retracted its initial argument purported by the author of the 1619 Project. And we also know that on Martin Luther King Day, on the day that this country chose to honor the late Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., the former president of the United States, issued what is called a, a report, the 76, 1776 Commission. So to say that the 1619 um, issue and the 1619 project has been without controversy would be, you know, saying, it, it would be saying too, it would be minimizing what is at stake in this conversation. So as a scholar of slavery and of revolutionary America, the 1619's project assertion that the country began in 1619 it wasn't revolutionary to me. It wasn't alarming. The very questions of liberty and freedom had very real and visceral concepts in colonial America. Centering United States history around the realities of slavery dislodges the American Revolution as the moment when the US was born. More importantly, starting this country's history in 1776 sanitizes the reality of the racial problems, not just current in this country, but sanitizes the problems involved in the total decimation of the indigenous populations. We know that anti-Blackness was firmly in place well before colonists' protests against Brit British tyranny. So I offer another critique. What does it mean to center the founding of the United States to the physical and sexual exploitation of women such as Angela? What does it mean to center the founding of the United States at the center of the physical and sexual exploitation such as, of women such as Am Angela to further the slaveocracy? To say nothing of what starting the country's history in 1619 does, again, to the histories of the people who were here well before the colonists. 
So for these and so many other questions and some with some real life consequences, the 1619 project serves as a point of departure for discussions and for curriculum revolutions, right? We shouldn't shy away from any of the controversy generated by the project or the response to the project. It is not lost on me, nor should it be lost on any scholars of early America that indeed less than one, just barely a one week ago, just barely shy of one day on January 20th, 2021, the 46th president of the United States, Joseph Biden, used his first hours in office to rescind the 1776 com commission's order. Okay, the, 70, 17, the 1776 commission's order, right? That's, that's the long prologue. That's the long prologue. There's a shorter prologue. There's a shorter prologue where we're getting more um, into what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about freedom, liberty, and African memory. My colleague Nugugi Watiango's first quote here, but African memory does not go quietly into that good night. It mounts resistance in both the African continent and the diaspora. And particularly in this era where Black Lives Matter or Black Lives Finally Matter internationally, nationally and internationally to people who are actually not of African descent where Black Lives Finally Matter, not just in the fact that African-Americans were, were worth more to the United States when they were enslaved than they were in free, than they were freedom. I use this quote from Shelton Hale Bishop, uh, formerly the, the rector of St. Philip's Church in New York in the early 20th century, who was a descendant of charity folks. And he says, they, African-Americans, are the only folks so great in number who have added to their original racial possessions, the language, the literature, the civilization, the culture, and the religion of an alien people. They seem sort of a crucible in which God is working out by experiment the problem of the adjustment of the races. Listen to that again. This is, okay, this isn't 2020. This is close to like 1939, 1940, I believe is when he was the rector, into the 60s. They seem to be, they seem a sort of crucible in which God is working out by experiment the problem of the adjustment of the races. So we know that 2020 was not a kind year for anyone. And so as I frame what is really my, my, my formal remarks, the fun part of this conversation, I know again that some of us have been sequestered for 11 months. Um, I dedicate my remarks to those enslaved like Angela and the countless unnamed people who were lost not in the slave trade, but also, whoo, I wasn't ready for that, lost um, to the pandemic. I would also dedicate this to those whose lives and actions continue to remind us that Black Lives Matter. That was just the prologue. So you can just sit back. Scott, I hope I hadn't lost any people, any kind of um, backers, <laughs> money backers. This is all up for conversation. Um, so we're gonna begin with the formal part of the talk where I speak actually about charity folks. Charity folks is a ghost of slavery who refuses to be silenced. She finds herself in the company of her 18th century contemporaries. She finds herself in the company of Ona Judge, the enslaved woman who, as Erica Armstrong Dunbar said, beat the president. She finds herself in the company of poet and author Phyllis Wheatley. As a ghost of slavery, Charity Folks finds herself in the company of Margaret Garner's beloved daughter, the young girl known only as Celia Slave, Sarah Bartman, Sarah Bartman, Sally Hemings, Sojourner Truth, Queen Nanny of the Maroons, and countless other unnamed women who haunt historical memory precisely because they carry the weight of the African diaspora's traumatic past. Collectively and individually, their lives testify to the multifaceted legacies of enslavement and attempts by camp captives to dismantle the slave system without suppressing the system's most violent and horrific truths. Horrific truths. The recovered past of enslaved Black women underscore the competing interest involved in remembering, constructing, and commemorating their lives. So Charity Folks isn't as well known as the Bond, as the Bond women mentioned, but her story is no less compelling. Charity Folks, is a man, Charity Folks, a manumitted woman from Annapolis, Maryland, has really remained an obscure historical figure because enslavement in Maryland is almost exclusively associated with two figures, orator and abolitionist Frederick Douglass and abolitionist and Civil War scout, Harriet Tubman. We know that Douglas is commemorated throughout the nation's capital and the neighboring state of Maryland. In, in 2013, a seven foot statue of Frederick Douglass was unveiled at the US Capitol building to commemorate the Emancipation Proclamation. Um, 
There's also been a one-man show about Frederick Douglass that has now been adopted by Spike Lee for production. Similar to Douglass, Harriet Tubman has gained, gained increasing fame over the last, I don't know, 100 years of her death. She is, as a, she is a popular subject of children's and young adult books and appears in school textbooks from elementary through college. We know in 2013 to 2014, the National Park Service opened the Harriet Tubman National Railroad site in Eastern Maryland. And in 2017, they, explored, they expanded the Harriet Tubman National Historical Park in Auburn, New York. Okay, we know in 1619, after many, after considering many nationally known women, the US Treasury announced its decision to place Tubman's image on the $20 bill, replacing Andrew Jackson. And that was not without controversy. That conversation has died down for a moment, but guess what? It has been re-resurrected re, re just in the last week with the administration changing, okay? One of the shows I think that everyone should watch, absolutely everybody, it's just been picked up. It's, <laughs> it's just been picked up by the OWN Network, finally. I've even had my students do a whole um, tweet campaign. Harriet Tubman was immortalized in not just the movie, right? Not just the movie that came out in fall 2019, but in the, first of all, the WGN television series, The Underground. Okay, actress Aisha Hines delivered a riveting hour-long monologue as Tubman, and the episode won critical acclaim. I've heard the show is coming back. It's arguably the best show you will ever watch on network television that you can teach to, that you can watch, that you can cry to, and you can kind of groove to great songs on it. Um, it's called Underground. Wonderful. Wonderful, okay? So I say this all because in all of this conversation, who gets lost? Charity folks. This, this, what I'm going to do today is I trouble the public memory in Maryland by arguing that as a manumitted woman, that means a woman who was freed from slavery, right? Freed from slavery before slavery was abolished. Charity folks is more representative, uh, more representative of the enslaved experience in Maryland than Douglas or Tubman. Back it up. Charity folks is more representative of the enslaved experience in Maryland than Douglas or Tubman. Tubman, I'm not gonna make friends today. Folks did, uh, charity folks did not free, sorry, charity folks did not flee bondage like Douglas or Tubman or end her life in poverty like Tubman. There is indications that she was not literate, but she was, that she was literate enough or at least knowing enough in the verses of the law to know that she, um, could use the legal system to her advantage. So she was not an orator like Douglas. She was not an orator like Sojourner Truth. She was not a Civil War scout like Tubman. Nonetheless, folks and her descendants were like other enslaved people in Maryland who gained their freedom in the decades leading up to the Civil War. If you don't know about Maryland or Merlin, um, let me just say a few things. Maryland, this small geographic region boasted a remarkably fluid portion, population of free, enslaved, and quasi-free Blacks. Folks lived her entire life in the Chesapeake, and she, over, and she occupied the overlapping zones of slavery and freedom throughout the course of her life. And in some ways, she was not unlike many an, an, Af she was not unlike many an African American in a state, though fairly dedicated to slave labor, also had a burgeoning free labor economy. So Charity Folks not only spent most of her life in Maryland, but she spent most of her life within this small radius, one, a, a few blocks, okay? Um, when she was freed, she, she had a home on Church Street right over here. But even before that, even before that, she was enslaved right down this street. Now you know it is at the Duke of Gloucester Street of Annapolis, if you know it now. And then, so she was here enslaved in the house of John Ryder, who I'll speak about more. Um, if you go across the street, so Charity Folks was enslaved in the house of John Ryder right over here. If you go across the street, you will see the house of Charles Carroll of Carrollton, the first sign of the Declaration of Independence. And behind us, and I don't have my glasses on, so I really could actually have this slide all the way backwards. So please don't quote me. Um, then we go down Doctor Street where, they, where, where she also, she, her daughter's, decided to settle, okay, once they were free. Who was Charity Folks? 
Charity Folks does not enter the historical record until she's an adult. One local historian suggests that she was born at Bel Air Plantation, 10 minutes outside of Annapolis. And for those in Maryland, I know it's Blair, it's not Bel Air Plantation, it's Blair Plantation. Um, and, but there's no evidence that supports this claim. Like many enslaved persons, Charity Folks' re reconstructed life elicits questions whose answers seem to be lost to history. What can be documented is this. She was born somewhere between 1757 and 1759 to an enslaved woman named Rachel Burke. Uh, what we do know is that she was freed in 1797 and in 1811, a freedom, cert a freedom certificate describes Charity Folks as a bright aged, a bright mulatto aged about 52. So as I've suggested, few of her details of her early life are known, okay? And when I was introduced to Charity Folks, it was through one document. I was introduced to their Charity th Folks through one document. And that was the manumission rec record, um, 1797, that granted her manumission and also, also spoke about the manumission of two of her children. Fast forward, fast forward to 1800, 1808 in particular, Charity Folks enters the court, the, the county courthouse with her former owner, Mary Rideout, and she petitions for the the freedom of not just her, not her, sorry, I'm, whoo, this is when, for the audience, this is when you have done a talk so often that you forget that everyone else has to wait and go with you, okay? Wait and go with you. So Charity Folks was enslaved by a man named John Rideout, okay? John Rideout was a stamp collector, a lawyer, um, arguably perhaps a loyalist to the British cause. Um, he, he actually owned the ship that brought the um, legendary Kunta Kente, if we believe that Kunta Kente from Alex Haley's roots is a real person. He owned the ship that brought, that brought um, Kunta Kente to Annapolis shores. So charity folks is not just a living person, but she's weaved into public uh, narratives all the way through her, her life. I'm thinking about time. I'm thinking about time. So Charity Folks, this is what we do know about her. Okay, Charity Folks, a life and a family history. Charity, like I said, was born in Bel, at Bel Air Plantation or that is at least what local lore says, local lore states. It is believed her mother, Rachel Burke was enslaved there by uh, former government, Governor Samuel Ogle before he passed. And at some point, Rachel Burke received her own freedom and that of her son's freedom. We know that Charity Folks, what we know about Charity Folks is that she spent maybe 10 to 11 years of her early life at Bel Air Plantation with her mother and her brother. And then when um, John Rideout married Mary Rideout, the son, the, the daughter of Samuel Ogle, <laughs> um, she she went to live with her with her um, owner, Mary now Rideout, who she knew, and John Rideout, who she did not know. Okay. We know this is the John Rideout house as it stands today in Annapolis, Maryland. These uh, it, it is part of the, the historic trust. John Rideout made row houses, so we have not just one house but several houses. This is um, from a history his historical survey of, of buildings in Maryland from the 1950s. Let me, let me say this. When I met Charity Folks in the archive, again, there was only one document that tied her, her to any kind of history. And this was this document that freed her in 1797. Over time, I found another document that talked about her, not just her freedom, but also trying to, she was trying to advocate for the freedom, purchase the freedom of her remaining children in bondage. And she was so astute that not only was she able, not only that was she able to negotiate her freedom in the course of her lifetime, right? But she verified and made sure the freedom of her children who had been freed before her were also freed and it could never be taken away from her. And then in 1808, when she enters the court again with Mary Rideout, 
she and Nat or Mary write out on Charity's, um, I'm going to say petitioning, but we don't have a record of that, then decides to free two more of Charity's children and puts in, puts in place many mission provide, provisions for future generations of Charity's family. So within two documents, I saw the manumission, the liberation of three generations of an enslaved family. This family spread over three generations is thought to be one of, one of the most sought after legacies of the American Revolution for enslaved people. And that is access to freedom through legal deed. Okay, so Charity and her family were, were freed. Um, and their freedom was staggered, right? And in 1797, when I saw this first document, it did indeed look like what I called a splendid Christmas gift. It was not a gift of immediate freedom, however. Manumission was often a lengthy and difficult process. And Charity's gift, again, was only one marker in the family's long struggle for freedom. Let me reiterate that Rachel Burke, Charity's mother had gained her freedom as adult and had gone on to purchase the freedom of her son, James. In 1794, Thomas Folks, who then becomes Charity's husband, bought his own freedom from a local shopkeeper. John Rideout manumitted Charity's eldest daughter in 1786 when she was about five. Five years later, John Rideout also freed Mary Folks, another, another child of Charity's. Thus, at least five members of Charity Folks' family preceded her in the transition from slavery to freedom. There are debates about how Charity came to her freedom. It is believed the local story is that she had um, tended to the Rideout's nephew, um, Horace. They had she had tended to him during a life-threatening illness and she was awarded her freedom because of her loyalty. But I have questions. I have questions I, because I just said that Charity had a family history of access to freedom. So freedom wasn't something new to her. Freedom wasn't something that might've been benevolently uh, awarded her. I suspect that her ability to become free and to, to secure the freedom of future generations is also because she and her husband were working towards this as a family goal. Eventually, family Charity Folks and her family were freed. In fact, Charity Folks walked into freedom with one of the, one of the most important things to African Americans, and that was their family. So Charity Folks walks into freedom with the most important thing, family. But slavery, slavery was never far from her. For African Americans like Charity in Maryland, freedom did not mean a distancing from slavery. Charity folks and, and eventually her daughter, also named Charity, continued to work for the Rideout family. They had to work for wages. In Maryland, you Maryland, like many states, you could not, one could not simply free their enslaved population. One had to ensure that this person would not become a, a, a problem to society, it would not become prevalent on early county uh, relief rolls, right? So enslaved people could not be, enslaved people who were the backbone of <laughs> the labor force could not legally be freed because of rhetoric surrounding the fact that people did not want them to become a, 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 a burden to the county purse, okay? So charity folks was not far from slavery. As I mentioned, she did not move very far from the right out home when she was when she was uh, when she was freed. Now, one of the things that is great is Charity Folks's um, freedom arrangement with the right outs translated into a home on the corner of Church Circle and Duke of Gloucester Street, right in the map I had just shown you a moment ago. That was two short blocks from right outs from the right out residence. So Charity Folks begins freedom with money, and she also begins freedom with the most tangible expression of wealth in early America besides family. She begins it with property. I can come back to the question and answer how she arrives at this point. Um, I, I wanna continue and talk about the ghost of slavery, just because our time is so short. 
For charity folks, aspects of the institution of slavery were visible everywhere. A narrow street separated her house from Reynolds Tavern, which you see right here, where bond people were bought and sold. She continued to frequent the market that was just docks away to, and viewed slaving vessels coming into the ports of Annapolis. On any given day, she could look out from her home on church circle to St. Anne's Church, where notable members of early American society were buried, including and not limited to Johns Hopkins, Charles Carroll, and his son, Charles Carroll Carrollton, signer of the Declaration of Independence and one of the largest slaveholders during his lifetime, lar largest slaveholders in what becomes the United States. Slavery even existed with, within folks' own household. This was heartbreaking to me. An 1820 census lists her as the owner of one bonds person. This can be dicey though, this can be dicey. Did she actually own an enslaved person or was the tradition as it was in the upper South for free black people to buy family members of, of other friends and other loved ones and keep them enslaved until they were legally allowed to free them. We do not know, we do, we do not know, okay? Despite efforts to keep her maturing family close, Charity folks' decisions that she made in slavery or was forced to made in, make in slavery often haunted her. Family members remarked that Charity folks appeared to have a greater fondness for Charity, small, little Charity, her baby. And this was the daughter who remained enslaved while other children were manumitted, but little Charity was the child with whom Charity folks spent most of the time with. Thomas folks, Charity's husband said that, his daughter's influence would carry his wife to hell. And Charity's older relationships with her older children were often strained. This created a visible, visible tension between her two daughters who upon Charity folks' death, the daughters sued one another over, a, over an alleyway, a foot, a, a, not even 13 inches, I believe, of property that separated the house that Charity folks Little, little charity folks resided in and the alleyway that her sister used to get to the back of another house. They fought over that little piece of property. So, so deep was their, was their um, if we wanna call it their, their trauma from not, being li not living with their mother, right? They competed against everything. They competed over everything, okay? Um, because we're winding up, I will, I will say this, that Charity's folks is, um, Charity folks owned the property that, that now holds the Banneker Douglas Museum in Maryland. Charity folks at the time of her death owned four, if not five properties. And one of those properties we know was later sold by a descendant um, to Mount Moriah Church. Mount Moriah Church eventually sells the church to um, the state of Maryland and it becomes the Banneker Douglas Museum, one of the most important rep repositories for African-American life in, in Maryland. Charity Folk suffered a paralyzing stroke in early 1834 when she was near 75 years old. She regained her ability to walk and some ability to speak, but later died, but died within that same year. She left real estate to each of her three surviving granddaughter, sorry, she left, she left real estate to each of her three surviving daughters and to one granddaughter. She did not leave property to her son, James, because reportedly they were in a vicious fight at one point and he drew a knife on her and called her ill names. This is a picture of Charity Folks Bishop. It's not actually a picture of Charity Folks. Um, there isn't a picture to my knowledge of Charity Folks that exists. It's a picture of her daughter, Charity Folks Bishop. And um, this is a, a picture of Charity Folks Bishop's uh, uh, tombstone in the St. Anne Cemetery in Annapolis. This is a picture of William Bishop who was uh, married to Little Charity. William Bishop at any time was one of the richest men in Annapolis. He is actually descended from a white man and a black woman. He, he also was manumitted early on in his life and made a, a career for himself as pulling carts, as a carter and also um, properties turning properties, flipping properties, just like you, just like people would do today. But hair, but the, the, the legacy of charity folks is, is, is longer and is brighter 
than just this physical property that she might have owned. The legacy of charity folks spreads beyond Maryland up to New York, where her descendant, her descendant who later becomes rector of the church um, of St. Philip's Church, her descendant Hutchins Chu Bishop, because of his ability to pass for white, partnered with John Nell, a developer in, in New York. And because of his appearance, they were able to purchase property in Harlem. Harlem was at a point when, when black people weren't welcome uptown. They were able to purchase property in Harlem. It later became what is known today as the YMCA in Harlem. And so there are these li li living, living legacies of charity folks. Despite all these legacies, charity folks for most, for most reasons, in most ways, was a forgotten ancestor. We don't know exactly where she was buried. This is where I've decided that she had to have been buried. A genealogy report says, um, one of the family charts says that charity folks, wife of Thomas folks, made to the former governor's wife, is buried in St. Anne's Cemetery. I placed this wreath here to honor her. And if you look closely in the back, I also placed this wreath back here to honor Charity, um, Young Charity. So in the time we, we have remaining, because we don't have much time, because I set the heart out, I want to read a little bit from my epilogue because that'll keep me from getting tongue tied during this very moving part. And that will open us up for questions. So when I submitted this manuscript to the press, I felt unsettled. The book was finished, but it wasn't complete. And I felt compelled, and in truth, I felt guided to find and meet a woman by the name of Liberty Richard, the great grand, the granddaughter of, of Reverend Shell, the granddaughter of the Reverend Shelton Hale Bishop, whose quote I started with, and the daughter of Dr. Elizabeth Bishop Davis Trussell. I learned of Liberty's existence from Gail Silver at St. Philip's Episcopal Church. And I was contacted, put in contact with her through very different, various channels, various channels until one day my message got to her ears and she called me on the phone. December, 2012, first time we spoke, she said, Jessica, this is Liberty Rashad. And I said, hmm, given name? She said, given name. I said. Liberty is an appropriate name for the descendant of freedom fighters. Let me tell you about your family. The irony was not lost on either of us. As we spoke about her ancestor charity folks, we realized that we were quickly talking about two different women. Liberty was well versed in the history of charity folks Bishop, the daughter, but she had never heard of charity folks senior. So charity folks was even lost to her own family. On Easter Sunday, 2013, I met Liberty and her family at the Annapolis, at the Annapolis dock by the Alex Haley Memorial. Liberty had never vis visited the city before. We spent the day touring and trading stories about her ancestors. We even walked past the right out house and the owner at that point just happened to be taking trash out. Liberty looked at me, I looked at Liberty. She went to introduce herself and she was trying to be a little bit too formal. And I, in the way that I do, stepped in front of her and said, so they're descended from charity folks. And in that moment, we were actually inv invited inside this home where the enslaved charity had lived and had worked. We spent an additional two days retracing her family's past. The trip was profound, it was blessed by the ancestors, and it exceeded our expectations. Her presence was everywhere. We felt her when we entered the John Rideout House, the Banneker Douglas Museum, and as we stood in front of the ground where her, for, her house formerly stood. Ironically, that's now a Bank of America building. We felt as we entered St. Mary's Catholic Church and snapped, and, and snapped photos and toasted to her memory. We ended our visit at the Bishop family plot in St. Anne's Cemetery. Liberty placed flowers honoring her ancestors and called out their names. Charity wanted to be remembered by her family. If the story of charity folks is any indication, what we do matters. The stories of enslaved women and more general, uh, the, the stories of enslaved women and black women more generally are crucial to our understanding of the long arc for freedom. 
The stories of enslaved women and black women more generally are crucial to our understanding of the long arc for the fight for freedom in this country. The story between Liberty and Jessica Millward and Charity didn't end in Annapolis. I am happy to say in the irony of irony, the things that happen when you do family history is that Charity's family, here's Liberty, former husband. Um, I believe her Liberty son was taking the picture, but I'm joining the family scene, just fit right in because two summers ago, the descendant of charity folks did an, HP, an HBCU, Historically Black College and University summer program at the University of California, Ir Irvine, where I work. So we also toasted pictures and here's the family again, here's Zuri, the, the actual student and family member that brought us together. And so I just would like to say for those of you that do family history, and you feel like there might be blocks and roadblocks. I worked on charity folks who I'm not related to for a better part of 12 years before I had a break in her story. I'll leave us here because our time is short. I like to believe that charity folks is finding peace. She rests at the center of her family plot, surviving the ebb and flow of time, encircled by all her people. She and her descendants testify to the uncomparable spirit of survival and adaptation among enslaved people. Charity folks in whatever form, be it enslaved, be it manumitted, being a ghost, being a forgotten ancestor. Charity folks seems to call out from the past and tri triumphantly proclaim, and I say triumphantly proclaim, particularly in this moment, of a pandemic and particularly in this moment where the power structure continues to be a little shaky in this great country. Charity folks has a word for us, okay? Charity folks seems to call out from the past triumphantly proclaiming, despite it all, we are still here. Thank you. So Jessica, I'd, I'd, I'd love to just um, a couple questions that I have on my mind <laughs> um, about sort of origins, experience, and maybe uh, impact. Uh, I think one of the things I really appreciated about your book is how you were able to, and like some of the great American historians, I'm thinking of like Laurel Ulrich and her midwife's tale of, you know, you take these uh, and it's, it's, <laughs> It's like our finding freedom, where you have these 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 little these people who pop up out of the darkness <laughs> with this compelling sort of story and pop out down. But to really understand and contextualize and fill in the gaps, you need to do a lot of work of understanding the context of their lives. And that you, you spent a good deal of time in the book of sort of making the point that it's so necessary to understand the world of people like charity folks. Um, and one of the things I was interested in, and, and it's been great, both listening to the talk, reading the book, actually seeing that we're joined by a lot of people from Maryland. I see the Maryland Museum of uh, Women's History with a great uh, uh, exhibit coming up about enslavement to emancipation, Banneker Douglas Museum. I have lived at Fells Point in Baltimore and in Joppa. So this is a landscape that's that's familiar to me. Um, and also, you know, understanding uh, the, 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 the the peculiarity also of the place and the origin of people. And you, you spent a good deal of time talking about the particular origins uh, and region in Africa where quite a few people who were enslaved in Maryland and eventually found their freedom came from. And um, I'm uh, one of the, the folks in the, in the chat there uh, asked that, that we ask a question about what have you done in terms of connecting uh, to, uh, to Ghana? I know you, you've traveled a bit. Can you just talk a little bit about uh, how your work has been influenced by that, that connection? Thanks for the question. It's also a subject of a much, 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 much longer conversation. Mm -hmm. um, when you deal with genealogy, so I'm talking to the genealogists right now. I'm not talking to the historians that have to have the hard, firm evidence right now. Mm -hmm. I'm talking to the genealogists. Mm -hmm. When you deal with genealogy, one of the first things they tell you to do is you need to open the passage. You need to open the veil. Mm -hmm. You need to be open to people speaking to you from the past. 
historians do do that, but we're not really, some of us, we all have different processes, okay? Um, there's so many, so many ways I can answer this question. I will go with the truth. I'm, I'm going to answer it by, by, I have a friend out there in the audience, Adam McNeil, and Adam McNeil knows that um, I can be very, very rigid. And he also knows that I, I just can't help myself when, when there's a moment to be honest. Um, I don't know for certain that Charity Folks was descended from people from Ghana. To me, it made logical sense based on the slave trade based on the numbers of people from, from Ghana and then later Santa Gambia and how they spread out. To me, it made sense. Um, there, were, there was a moment, for example, where we were on the dock at um, Annapolis and I was trying to explain to Liberty and her family where I thought the family was from. And I said, that may be Ghana. And, and Liberty says, you mean we might be a con? She already knew, like, she already knew ethnicities and ethnic groups. I said, huh, we're just gonna pretend that's a, a coincidence. I did not do the kind of uh, study where you can do where you can get the the equipment and 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 look for you know I want to say Xerox that's not the word the X-ray the X-ray <laughs> X-ray thingy the X-ray thingy that would tell us if Charity's body is is actually at Saint Anne's Cemetery. I actually, as I detailed in the book, um, waited for Liberty to arrive, and that was the confirmation that I needed. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of going to Ghana, I took students in 2010 for three weeks to do a, an exchange program. And during that time, I actually delivered a version of this paper. And there's something for my African Americans out there, you, you're going to get it. There's something when you speak that name of ancestors and it clicks, it clicks. I was delivering this paper in Ghana and in the book, I call out the num names of, fam of charity folks as family members. There was such an electricity in the air. There was an electricity in the air. Mm. I that's that's all the proof I need. That's all the proof I need um, as a genealogist. Now, as a historian, of course, we want more. We more, want more hard data, but we know the archives for enslaved people are very, very hard, right, to come by. That doesn't mean we should be be um, dissuaded. I will also say something about microcardial DNA and the DNA tests. Um, Charity's family is very open to having DNA testing so we can prove this. However, that it has to follow the line of the mother is where we fall into problems because mm. Liberty is related to Charity folks through her father's line. Mm. So we're not sure that would get us very far. Mm. I do know there's a lot of Charity folks as people out there because I get emails from them constantly. So if any of you are on this call or see this video and want to talk about your DNA testing, and want to do it, we can talk about it. Um, so, and I'll say one more thing. <laughs> I see a question here. This, this is when, if you're in a black church, you look to your neighbor, you say neighbor, the pastor has you look to your neighbor. This is gonna be a different kind of talk. There's a question in the chat that says, what is a question about Charity's life that you would like to have answered if you had the chance to talk to Charity? Who says I haven't? You weren't ready. <laughs> only probably one person only was with you. Who says I haven't? <laughs> the enslaved people are very persistent, right? Voices from the past are very persistent. Some of us, we all have different language, how we inter interact with our subjects, right? I am, I cannot believe I'm saying this. This must be my COVID feelings coming out. As someone who, who, who is hypersensitive, intuitively, empathically, who says I haven't? Hmm. I was taught by a very important slavery scholar whose name I will not mention. She says, when you're approached by these ghosts of slavery, you simply ask, what would you have me know? Hmm. I think that's a great question for any, anyone doing genealogy as well. Mm -hmm. You know when your ancestors are in the room, ask them what they would have you know. Hmm. There's a reason that you are, um, attached to them and they're attached to you whoever you are doing the, the genealogy work so scott i'm sure that is not the, con the kind of answer you wanted i'm happy to do <laughs> to pull it back and do more um <laughs> book 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 centered book centered um, no 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 uh, this is uh, this is a, this is uh this is a questing group of people here who uh 
are interested in all questions and, and all perspectives. So no, I really, I appreciate this. This is, uh, again, um, difficult work to do. Um, it's, it's among the hardest kind of work we do uh, as scholars who are often so rooted in the written word. And so, um, no, I appreciate this very much. Um, a qu another question that's come up, this was a question from Danny um, Massaro about, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I, uh, um, uh, Velva uh, Zarley who asked about uh, charity folks and how she acquired property. So maybe talking about that, that uh, her transition from being enslaved to free and how she was able to uh, acquire property. And again, there's a lot of great material in the book here, not just even specifically about her, but just the, the, the very complicated uh, web of experience in this, uh, in this revolutionary era. So what do we know about charity specific uh, path to um, ownership? Well, one of the things that I wanted to thank, thank you so much for the question. Um, mm -hmm. One of the things I also wanted to know is how did she come with this property? Mm -hmm. What do you mean? So I was introduced to a genealogist um, who knew a lot about the, the, the folks family. And so I came to Annapolis with my little notepad and I said, tell me about the property. Like, is this a Sally Hemings thing? I mean, what, 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 what how did she get on this property? We don't necessarily know. What we do know is the laws of Maryland were stipulated that you had to, as I said, enslaved people couldn't just be freed. They had to show that they were sufficient enough to take care of themselves. Charity folks was actually freed with a pension from the right outs. She then continued to work for wages for the right outs. Um, there are documents both in the Maryland Historical Society, well, the Maryland State Archives, in fact, um, where the right out family has shared records where um, First, it was asked that uh, by John Wright out that charity folks be taken care of um, almost better than others that when he passed because she had done so much for the family. Then when Mary Wright out passed, she left charity things like um, her feather bed and all her clothing. Mm -hmm. So then I also have to wonder about wonder what is this relationship? Are people related? Are they not related? Slavery so slippery. Um, it wasn't clear to me if it was a reciprocal relationship, if it was a relationship that was first steeped in violence or of love, it was just so, it's nebulous. We don't know that answer. But what we do know is what she then did with that property. And she became one of the wealthiest people in Annapolis. Mm -hmm. The combination of her working for wages and her um, salary, if you will, her, her pension. Also her husband was free black. So he also was working. Um, in, in and around Annapolis. So I think it's the combination of, of good fortune, of a pension, and also um, working as wage laborers. So uh, Lisa Crawley had an interesting question that maybe connects with this, referring to the legal battles um, with her daughters and that. And is that is that a part of a larger, do you think that's sort of idiosyncratic to this family or was it part of a larger um, phenomenon that you saw uh, within the free uh, black community? in this era? So this is, again, much, much long, very long answer, very short, <laughs> very long answer, very, very, very short in this time frame. This, this ordeal to secure freedom wasn't particular to charity folks' family, right? We have after the American Revolution, we have people primarily, primarily, but not exclusively in, in states like Maryland and Virginia that start protesting and, and, and using the language of the revolution mm -hmm. to protest for their own freedom, right? Um, in cities like uh, Charleston, South Carolina, where there's a more of a free wage economy and an informal economy, um, African-Americans mm -hmm. start, can start buying their freedom. So what I would say to this is simple. There are a variety of ways that people could earn their freedom. From the research I saw, of course, is all through legal documents that have to be signed by an owner saying that you're free. But there are far, so many other people who secured their own freedom by running away, right? Absconding, stealing their own freedom, um, resisting to the point of, of, of death, right? Um, there are ways that people secured their freedom. The legal terrain, you can look at the work of Lauren Schweninger. He cataloged basically all the petitions <laughs> ever to be presented in any court in the South and, and, and a little bit in the North by black people petitioning for their own freedom. Right, and the book, one of the book chapters talks in detail about the ways in which people had to be savvy with the law, even if they might not be able to read, 
or right, they had to be savvy enough or their lawyers had to be savvy enough to help them. Martha Jones will tell us um, in her book, her first book, her first book and then her second book, Martha Jones has a long discussion about the way in which many people who mounted freedom claims were often backed by Quakers and other abolitionist societies, right? You're in Philadelphia, I'm, I'm speaking to the choir. And also for people who did bring up claims for freedom, sued for freedom, sometimes they actually had, they, it was, it, they would either go back to where they were enslaved, more likely than not, they actually were, were held in the county jail where they could be protected from owners that wanted to reciprocate, uh, reciprocate uh, uh, their claim to freedom by, by, by reminding them that they're enslaved. So she wasn't unique. She wasn't unique. There's countless char charity folks out there. Mm -hmm. um, I think there are many stories to continue to be written. And Rita Myers has done some great work in South Carolina. Um, I know that there are people who are working on early America. They're starting to look at different aspects of how people um, uh, mm -hmm. negotiated their own freedom. So I don't mm -hmm. think that charity folks was remarkable in any way other than mm -hmm it was remarkable how she came to me. Does that make sense? Sure. Uh, any other <laughs> questions? <laughs> sure, well, yeah, I'm, I'm, I wanna spend a couple minutes just before we conclude, uh, just asking you about your, your teaching, uh, what your current projects are, kind of where are you, where are you taking your inquiring mind uh, next? Okay, I see, well, let me just say Jean, I see Jean Wolf's question. Did oh, yep. Did need research on her property identify who she purchases from and whether it was a gift. It did in fact, it did in fact, I went very, very detailed into the lots and how things were situated. Um, it was believed the house was gifted to her. The first house was gifted to her from the right outs somewhere in the course of the history of the family um, when her daughter and her son-in-law, Charity Folks Bishop and um, her son-in-law were, um, negotiating with the right out family about something else entirely, the house reverted back to the property of the right out family. That house in particular, I know, stayed and was either gifted or went back to, there was a deed that transferred the property back to the right out family. The other pieces of property, there's deeds where she, she bought them directly. Now, so where am I going next, Scott? Um, my next project, is um, also focused on freedom, but in a different era. I'm looking at the rec reconstruction period. I'm looking specifically at black women and how they use the, uh, the, um, the court system, be it the Freedoms Bureau or lo local courts to protest incidents of intimate partner violence. Read differently, I look at the, stated differently, I look at the first 50 years of freedom when black women had legal control of their body for the first time in history and how they protected themselves and what legal mm -hmm. claims they advanced in order to stay safe and to stay free. Can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> Me either. <laughs> well, Dr. Jessica Millward, I can't tell you uh, how, what a pleasure it's been. I hope uh, those who have not managed to pick up a copy of Finding Charities Folk, another pitch for the, uh, for the book, will we'll do so. Uh, I know you will not be a stranger. Um, I, uh, I think this just fits so beautifully into the work that we do at the museum to try to, the same sort of effort to uncover surprising stories about um, these, uh, these people, uh, their, their, their lived experiences, the, the messy story of creating a nation and always trying to make it a more perfect union. I'd, I'd love to end just by um, reading a couple lines from my new my new American hero, Amanda Gorman, who was so uh, just wow. I was not I was not prepared uh, there, but you know, many of you, all of you, must surely have heard uh, her recitation of her poem, "The Hill We Climb," and uh, just the lines: "Being American is more than a pride we inherit; it's the past." we step into and how we repair it. And uh, the hair stood up on my, on my neck when I heard her say that. This is uh, what joins us all together. Those of you who are joining us remotely from around the country, Dr. Millward, uh, all of our wonderful folks from the museum, 
world uh, in, in Baltimore and beyond. Uh, please be well, be safe. The aftertimes are coming. Wear your masks, but do come see us soon. Thank you all for being here tonight. Grateful to Haverford Trust for making, uh, making this series uh, possible. Goodbye Thank now. You. Thank you. Good night.